hope you grabbed your child's packet at the table over there. Their name's at the top. Each teacher has a different color, so hopefully you found that okay. My name is Miss Beagle, and I teach in River Birch 3. And my name is Miss Strawbridge, and I teach in River Birch 2. And I'm Miss Nielsen, and I'm in first grade this year, and I'm teaching in Linden 3. And I'm Deb Marshall, and I am in Linden 5. Here. <laughs> we have a few numbers, um, just to, important numbers for our grade level in our school. So we'll play a little bit of a game here. So the first one is 20. Does anybody know why 20 is important to us this year? <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is why the kids come. <laughs> by the numbers. Does anyone know why 64 is important to our first grade team? No guesses? This is our combined number of years of teaching. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, 37. Any ideas for 37? Your age. Oh, love you so much. Oh, we love you. I like the age, but that's a compliment to ask. Um, it's actually our combined years of teaching um, at Harry Bishop. And a big number, 150. What would add up to be 150? Number of Number of kids. Yeah. Uh, it's actually our combined ages, and we're not going to talk about which one made it go really high. But mine's 37. Oh, what? <laughs> the presentation by just discussing our school motto. Now, we're hoping that you may have heard about R-R-E-S at home, but basically those letters stand for being respectful, being responsible, being engaged, and being safe. And it's common language that your child's going to hear throughout the building. So not only is it language we're going to be using as first grade teachers, but when they go to their specialist or when Mrs. Nesvig addresses the whole school, it's words we're all going to be following and using together to work towards common goals. But we also have a special cheer that goes with it. And maybe you've gotten to practice at home, but we'd like to practice tonight with you. So I'm going to play the leader in the black, and you can play the purple as the students, okay? Are there any hornets in the hive? Buzz. What's the buzz about? R, R, E, S. We are hornets at our best. Respectful, responsible, engaged, safe. Buzz. Nice. Thank you for participating. <laughs> talk about as um, kind of overall of a couple Harry Bishop things. The first thing I want to talk about is school view. If you do not have a school view account yet, you want to make sure and get one. That is the way that we have all of your emergency information. If there would be a reason for us to get, need to get a hold of you or an emergency contact, that's where we go. If you already have a school view account, you need to go in and double check and make sure all of your information is correct. Between now and October 1st, when you log into your school view account, it'll ask you, do you want to update your things? Say yes, because if you don't by October 1st, then you will no longer have a school view account. So you want to make sure and do that by October 1st. If you don't have an account, if you go to parents, where's that little mouse? And you go to school view, and you scroll down, Right here, it'll tell you how to create a school view account. You need to email this school view at isc191.org 
and then they will send you a key number which will then get you into school view. So it's just really important for your child's safety, for us to be able to contact you, that you make sure this is up to date. In the past, we sent home a piece of paper and you filled out all your emergency contacts. We're trying to keep it all online right now, so it's just very, very important that you do that. The second thing I want to remind you about is online conferences. Um, last year we went to online conferences and we had great feedback from families about how easy it was to sign up for conferences and how much they loved it. Our conferences are October 12th and 13th. You can sign up, log on right now to register for your conferences. If you know your child's teacher, you simply click on their name, like Ms. Beagle will click on her name. And all of the times will come up. If it says not available, that means somebody has already registered that time. So you just choose a time and you put in your email and it'll even link to your calendar for you. If you go back, if you have more than one children, it makes it even easier for you now. You just go to register for multiple conferences. You put in both of your children and their teacher and then it'll show you side by side when those openings are. So if you want to have them back to back or if you want to have 20 minutes in between to go to the book fair or something, that gives you that opportunity. So last year, we did a great job in the fall. We almost had all parents sign up for conferences. In the spring, we had about 100 families that forgot. So I'm really hoping that we go back to people remembering that in the spring here and get that signed up. It'll be open until October 2nd. If you don't register by October 2nd, then you'll get a call from friendly Mrs. Fontana to remind you to have you help you get signed up for a conference. If you don't have internet access, please call us in the office and we will help you get signed up for conferences. The next thing I want to talk a little bit about is just the parking lot. If you drop off your children or pick your children up in the, um, in the parking lot before and after school, it's just really important that you follow some of our safety procedures. Up here, um, I have little maps, and they've been in our newsletters, on how kind of our flow of traffic works. If you have a relative or a friend who doesn't usually come to Harry Bishop to pick up children or your child, or they pick them up like once a week, it's really helpful if you share this with them. Just because if we have one person going the wrong way, it can kind of mess up the whole system. Um, on the back is our RRES for the parking lot, and it says things like, please don't talk on the cell phone when you are driving through the parking lot, or please don't park on the crosswalk, those sorts of things. So if you would just take a time to read through that to make sure that we're safe out at the parking lot. And the last thing I want to talk about is volunteering. We couldn't do all of the amazing things we do at Harry Bishop without so many volunteers taking their time to come and help us out at school. So I always ask parents to spend between five to 10 hours of the school year volunteering. That could be helping out in the classroom, it could be helping in the media center, it could be going on a field trip, lots of options. I do have um, Jenny Bishop, who's our academic volunteer coordinator from PTO, tonight to talk a little bit about what some of those volunteer opportunities might be. Hello, I know most of you have probably seen my face. <laughs> So, because there are many of you that are already volunteers a lot, so thank you. Um, this year, I took over as the academic volunteer coordinator for the school, but um, so I, along with the PTO volunteer coordinator, are asking to collect your emails if you would like to be on the volunteer um, notification email list. And it doesn't mean you are committed to a specific um, event or anything you will just get notices of different signups that are available. So for maybe library help, or for some classroom helping, or for a PTO event, all those type of signups will be sent through on this email list. There is a sign-up um, sheet over by the teacher packets. If you are not already on that list, meaning if you have not received an email from us already asking about um, meet your teacher night and things like that, you probably are not on our list or we have incorrect information. So you can add your email to that. And then also, there is a little blue sheet that I think I handed to most of you, but if you did not receive it, there's um, also some sitting there. This is going to talk about um, PTO. Uh, they have their first meeting coming up next Tuesday. The advisory, um, team is meeting at 5 o'clock before, so you have a couple different meetings you can attend that will help with the school. The first meeting they're going to talk and do some brainstorming for the 20th, um, Harry Bishop 20th birthday. There's some other um, topics that they'll be having. Uh, so on the back, you'll see um, some of the PTO events that are coming up and when they are. 
And here, for the volunteer opportunities, so let's say you got the sign up, um, the email saying, oh, sign up, sign up, and you weren't quite sure if you could, but then you say, oh, darn, where did that email go? <laughs> I can sign up. Um, you can always go to the PTO's website and click under volunteers and all those signups that are currently going on will be right there. Or if you go to Harry Bishop's web page, at the bottom there's those quick links. If you press on the volunteer, it will bring you right to that page also and you'll be able to see the current signups. Um, and then also their fundraisers, so funds that go right back to the school. Asian Bowl, if you eat there, tell them you're a Harry Bishop family. We get 10% of the pro, um, proceeds. And Woodland Pizza, look for the little sheet that comes home. There's a couple days each month that they'll give Harry Bishop um, cash for eating there. And then if you have a Target Take Charge, is going through, I think, till May. So if you have a Target card, you can sign your card up and get that last minute cash for our school. So thank you very thank much. You. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is our agenda is on the front cover of everyone's packet. So we'll just be in here to start. We'll go over a bunch of first grade curriculum and dates and information. And then we'll head back to your child's classroom. Um, throughout our presentation, or if you think of anything along the way, on the bottom we have a question section. Um, because of the number of people here and the short amount of time we have, we may not get to your question tonight. So if you could jot that down and leave it in your child's classroom tonight. We'll work as a team in getting those answers to you as soon as we can. Um, so if you follow along in your packet, um, we do. We start off with the beginning of the day, um, arriving to school here. Uh, first week is kind of underway. We're into our second week. Just a reminder that school starts at 9.05. So if your child is at school before that time, they do need to wait in the upper lobby by the office. Um, we are not supervising the children at that time, um, and they need to wait till they're dismissed by um, the bus patrols. So they will be dismissed by And we've had a few people kind of trickling in every morning, so we just want to make sure that 9.05 is the start time. With that said, we want to get things underway right away, and one of the most important things all of our classrooms do is morning meeting. Um, this comes from Responsive Classroom and basically it's a time where we can build community and we can get to know each other on different levels and it speaks of the social side of school and showing that it's just as important as the academic side. So it's a really important time for all of our class. So with that said, make sure your child gets on time, gets through their morning routine. Every person takes home a purple folder. This is our to and from take home folder. This is something your child wants to take out every morning. Inside is a way of communicating with the teachers. If there is a note or something that you need to slip in there to us, this is a way of communicating with us in the mornings. And I know I've already received a few lunch money um, checks for the lunchroom. They're asking if you can put your child's lunch um, check into an envelope or staple it into a piece of paper with their child's name on it. Um, it's easier for them to quickly put into the system. I think also adding lunch number is helpful. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. You can do that somewhere on the check or on the envelope. Yep. If I can piggyback on that, um, Ms. Nielsen, we reminded me we do a responsive classroom and one of the other things you may hear your child talk about is take a break area. Um, you may or may not have had that in kindergarten also but we kind of use that as a, a redirection within the classroom. So it's not a punitive thing, your child's not in trouble, but if they're not making the right choice or, or showing RRES, we just quietly ask them, they find a designated location where we have our take a break and in the room. Um, they stay there for a small amount of time and they rejoin when they're ready. And during that time, part of their responsibility is they're supposed to be thinking, okay, why did I have to go to take a break? What could I fix or what should I be doing instead? So you may or may not hear them talk about that. the chart? And then we've, this is in the process, but within the next week, um, we're gonna start doing these. We call them fix-it slips. Um, so if you see a little band-aid on the top, 
that's what these are. But it goes along with Harriet Bishop's R, R, E, S down the side. Um, and your child might receive one of these if, if he or she was in some kind of physical altercation. We just definitely want to get that message home to you for sure so you know about it and see if you have any questions. Um, and we'll also send it home if your child's needing a lot of redirection in the same kind of area day after day. But with that said, we all know that first graders, this is first grade, they're learning, they're going to make mistakes, they need redirection every day, and that's part of who they are. Um, so it's not like we're going to, you're not going to see this every single day. <laughs> but um, if you do see it, just know that for us to take the time to fill it out, it probably means that it's a significant thing that's been reoccurring in the classroom as well. And we just ask that um, there's a part on here too that says if you could talk with your child about um, a way they could fix it. So if it's with another student, with the teacher, or something that was broken, if they could have a plan to come back the next day, um, on the back of the paper they could draw or write what they could do to fix it. Um, and then if your signature could go on the bottom that you discussed this and made that connection at home too, we'd appreciate that. All right, so after morning meeting, first grade goes into their writing time period. Part of the writing is right from the beginning. With right from the beginning, you're going to be seeing, probably, if you've been in any of the classrooms, you're going to be seeing these thinking maps. And these are a way for kids to organize their thoughts before doing an actual writing piece. We're going to start off right away with a me unit. And in that me unit, we have the opportunity for the kids to learn how to use each of the maps associated with their family and with themselves. We also are going to be starting spelling, but that's going to be after conferences. Right now, what we're doing are pre-tests so that we can find out where your child is at in their spelling. At conferences, you'll be getting a list and more explanation about how the whole program is going to work. But if you want to keep in mind that on Thursdays they take the test, and then on Friday in the Friday folder you'll be seeing the new list come home. The other part of our writing piece is the actual physical writing. Uh, we have samples of how the letters should be made. On the report card there is a section that does say writes legibly. And that means if we're looking at their writing, or if a friend is looking at their writing, their friend can actually read what they have written. This paper also shows all the strokes and how you do it, so if you want to uh, practice at home, you'll also be sh seeing sheets coming home that they've worked on at school. It'll probably come home as a packet. I know some of us do letter by letter and some of us do packet. we're going to be talking about is the specialists. Um, we have four specialists. Um, Mrs. Simpson is going to be our music teacher this year. Ms. Warmka will be teaching science for first grade. Mr. Lesh will be teaching phi ed and Mrs. Lawrence will be teaching art. One thing unique about our district is we spend one full week with each specialist. So over that entire week your child would be visiting that same special teacher every single day for that week. And we're on a rotational schedule. Keeping in mind that when it is your gym week, you want to make sure that you are um, making sure your child's coming to uh, school with their gym shoes on or bringing them separately so they can change in, uh, so they can participate in Mr. Lesh's class. Also, it is their classroom, so if there's any communication or issues that um, came up or celebrations that um, occurred during that time, make sure that you're communicating it with that teacher. That is their classroom and they're the ones that you should be contacting um, for whatever the reason may be. Uh, and their stuff would be on the school website as well if you're looking for their uh, school phone number or their email information. So the next part is a really favorite time of the day for first graders, <laughs> lunchtime. Um, and we are in split lunches, so the two River Birch classes go together at about the same time, and the two Linden classes go together at the same time, and part of the reason for the split is to kind of facilitate the kitchen staff, make it a little bit easier for them to be able to prep the food, the materials, and have them ready, so we don't have 
80 to 90 first graders all coming in at once. So um, we do overlap a little bit with our lunch time, so that's nice. The kids still see each other. And then we had a couple things that we wanted to share with you. Some of you might already be familiar with this, and if you are, you get a gold star. Um, but there's two things that you can find on the district website. Um, the lunch menu you can access online if you're interested. And if everything starts out with this site, the www.isd191.org. And if you go to the parents tab, click, there's a drop down menu. Um, and I know it's difficult to read, but this says parent resources. If you select that. Then there's a lot of links of different things, but under student services, there's a food services menu. And then here it has like elementary, junior high, so you can select elementary and then you have your fabulous lunch menu. Mm -hmm. This also comes home at the back of the Harriet Bishop newsletter monthly, so for the next month. Probably one you want to hold on or put somewhere. Um, and this is another thing that I find really valuable as a parent in this district, um, fee pay. So you can pay for your child, you can put money in your child's lunch account over the computer. So you start out at the same site, and if you go to, this one you have to go to school view. So you would have to be registered like Mrs. Nesvig was talking about. Um, so here's a school view account, you just have to add your, put in your username and password. This is my son's account. Um, and it's right up in the way left corner, but it says fee pay right up here. So if you click on that tab, it'll take you to the next one. And this one is a little benign. I didn't know what to do on this one. <laughs> you actually click right on this picture right here of the meal counts. So it will show you, um, I, have, I have two sons, so it'll tell you they're both on the same school view account. But it's pretty cool too because it itemizes what they had. Like my son had some sunflower seeds the other day, apparently. <laughs> um, and then it says, you know, he had lunch. Um, so it's it's kind of cool to look and just see what's happening with the child. Um, but then there's a spot up here where you can do. I believe it's right here where you can add. No, sorry, right here where it just says add amount. So you can click on that and then you can push in a certain amount. You can also have a sort of not know that. Well, so, yeah, she was saying you can you can set click up. over here, and if it gets down below a certain quantity, so if it gets down to ten dollars, it can automatically take out of your credit card, whatever amount you want. That's cool. So I didn't know if you could hear in the back, but they said you can set it up on auto pay, so you can it'll take it out of your credit card when it yep. gets a certain whenever it hits a certain amount. Yep. The only and it'll give you an alert, an email alert that it's getting there. Yep. The only thing to to warn, so I did this for kindergarten is that when it comes to the end of the year, you might want to stop it because about four days before end of school, it took out 50 bucks. And I was like, oh, because uh, you didn't want it to take out $50 and then have it sit there all summer for next year. So one learning curve is as you get near the end, you might want to turn it off. And I, I don't have the auto pay, but I do have where it sends you the an alert if it gets, you can set, if it gets under $10 or under $5. And that's kind of convenient because you guys are busy enough, you don't remember exactly how much you're in your child account, so it's kind of nice. If they come home with a little red stamp on their hand too, that's just another reminder that their lunch account got too low. And so the lunch staff will do that if that's necessary. After we um, come back from lunch in all of our classrooms, we have our big lit in 190 District 191. We use a balanced literacy approach. So that's a framework that uses multiple little pieces to make up our literacy instruction. Um, typically it'll start with an interactive read aloud, which is a time when a teacher is um, sharing a story with the class. Um, it's a time for us to model our thinking and how we engage in the story in a deeper way, what we think about, what we look for, what we notice. Um, it's also a time we'll engage our, our students in discussion. They might have a peer-to-peer uh, -peer discussion and share their ideas. So just shared time and a safe place to practice those um, comprehension strategies. In your packet, um, we've listed eight strategies, and those are the deeper um, thinking that happens when a child or when we are reading. Not just reading the words in a pretty way, but understanding 
what they're actually reading and making connections, predicting what will happen next, inferring what this could mean. Um, so those, that's the time that interactive read aloud is when we're showing what that looks like. Um, after we would do that, we might even have a shared reading where our students <coughs> and the teacher will engage in a similar um, experience. We'll read a book together, we'll have a poem, a short story. The, the purpose of that would be building fluency. It's always good for students to have a model of a connected story, one that you enjoy listening to. And first grade is a great time to develop that fluency with some of that um, inflection and then excitement in their reading. So that would be a, nice, a time when we would do that together, teacher and students together. Um, we would then probably move into guided reading. Um, these next couple weeks we'll be doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one assessing, trying to gather information of where your child is at. Um, specifically in their reading level, knowing first grade is a great, great time um, to grow a lot as a reader. So we want to see where your child is, and in guided reading we would instruct a little bit above their independent level to get them moving on to that next level. Um, they'd be with peers in a small group who are in a similar place. We would be choosing the books for them at that point to guide them through vocabulary and discussion with each other. Next would be um, sometime during our literacy block, we hope to engage in conferencing, um, which is where students would be self-selecting their books. So some of us might call it independent reading time, read to self time. That would be a book your child has chosen to read, and your, your child's teacher will spend that time with them one-on-one, -on -one, interacting about the book they're reading, seeing how they're thinking about it deeply, if they are understanding what they're reading, um, and pushing them to the next level. So what we show in our instruction is actually being used as their independent reading. Um, as the year goes on, we expect first graders to pick better fit books as the year goes on, but we understand too that this is a time of just enjoying reading too. So we just want them to get excited about books. Um, Ms. Marshall kind of mentioned this too, we'll have the spelling piece. Um, we might also call that word work or word study. Um, so not only memorize, we don't want the students to memorize their spelling words, but understand the patterns of spelling, which also helps them in their reading. Um, so we'll take some time to teach them different um, patterns in words, prefixes, um, endings that make reading more understandable for them, and spelling. Um, and finally, um, this, or, no, Ms. Marshall mentioned this too, with writing. This kind of goes in the literacy piece as well, but the writer's workshop, there will be time when your child is getting to write what they choose to write um, and, and developing their own voice, but we would also have instructional moments and uh, mini lessons where we would teach about um, the mechanics of writing and push them to the next level by modeling it in our own writing. Recess, another wonderful part of the day for all first graders. And this is um, truly special because it's a time we all get to be out together. So um, there will be occasional community um, things that, where we might be separated, but this is a time where they get to reconnect with everyone as a whole group. But it's also a time where they're going to be hearing a lot of RRES talk because of the freedom of recess and the um, non-structured part of it, um, it's really gonna be emphasized that we're gonna be respectful and responsible while we're on that playground and stay safe. We, um, as first grade teachers, have come up with a Bark Buddy system. All of your children have been talked to about it and are learning about it and are watching for it. But basically, if a child has, um, needs a friend to play with, or they're feeling a little bit lonesome, or maybe the game that they were playing with somebody just really wasn't uh, what they were interested in. We have a, a tree that we've designated as our Bark Buddy tree. And the goal of this tree is to have the other students be on the lookout during recess to see if they could ask that person to come play with them. So the goal is to make sure everyone is included and everyone is playing with classmates during that recess time because it is such a social and important piece for all of them. So we've kind of learned about Bark Buddies and we've been on the lookout and it's something that we're really gonna try to emphasize throughout the year at recess to make sure everyone's feeling included during the recess time. Uh, 
Um, I'll start with the next part. So we move in from the day from recess and we come back in, get back to our classrooms. Um, but then it's time to move right into math. Now, just like in kindergarten, um, your child will be pre-test during the unit of study and they will be um, divided up amongst the four of us for math class. We're going to try to put your child with um, uh, the teacher teaching that would meet their needs where they're at. But this week we've been working on transitioning from all of the teachers' rooms throughout the hallway. Because unlike kindergarten in Red Oak, we're going to be moving up the stairs and down the stairs. And there's a lot more responsibility um, and trust that is going into the first graders while we move throughout the building. Um, but just to let you know that, again, like in kindergarten, we will be sending that note to let you know who your child will be working with for that time. So if you were to have any math questions during that time, um, that information will be sent to you um, and you can contact that teacher. So as part of our Math and Focus program, um, there's an instructional approach by the Math and Focus group um, and it's called Concrete pictorial abstract, and in a couple more slides, Ms. Spiegel will reference that. But just know that that's the way that instruction is kind of taught and reinforced. Um, and studies have shown that when kids can kind of manipulate themselves through these different levels, it reinforces the math skills that they already have. They can go through each one. Um, this, if, if you're a Googler, I love to Google, <laughs> if you put in Math and Focus Pentagon, this will come up so you can look at it more fully because I know it's a little hard to see, especially in the back. But it talks about um, mathematical problem solving components and all of the, the elements that go into problem solving. So there's five biggies that Math and Focus talks about. One of them is kind of your mindset or your attitude about math. And I know in first grade and actually our whole school and district, we've been talking a lot about fixed mindset and growth mindset um, and how it's so important um, a fixed mindset would be you can't change how you think or how you perceive something. So maybe you know you're smart, but when you get a hard question, maybe you don't want to do it because you're afraid to fail. You don't want that challenge because you might not be perfect. Where a growth mindset is you want to try. Even if you might not succeed 100%, you want to try and give it your all and, and your best. And we really want to encourage that and develop that in our kids because that will help them mathematically and everywhere in life. So one, one of the components is attitudes. Another is your skill set. Another one uh, is concept, numeration, number of concepts. Um, the different processes of math thinking and metacognition. We do this a lot too, I think, in first grade math where we have the students stop. Instead of just spitting out an answer, they really have to think, okay, now wait, does that make sense? How did I get to that answer? Is there another way that I could do that problem and, and get the same results? So, more of a global thing with math. Yes. <clears throat> so we're gonna see how your mindset is. We have a problem up on the board that you're gonna solve, and I want you to do it instinctually. How would you do this one? Mary had seven balls. Joe had three more. How many balls did Joe have? Are they in Mary's left hand or right? Eight. <laughs> All right, so instinctually, hopefully at this point in your life, you were able to just whip the answer out. There are students who also do that. That's the memorization. What we want to do, we want to celebrate that, but they know their fact that they're awesome. But we want to take it to the next level of thinking. I'm going to show you some questions that we use as first grade teachers to help bring those kids into the higher level thinking. This can also be very helpful at home if you want to use it whenever they're ever they're doing their math homework. For example, after they've done a problem, you can ask them, what did you notice? So in that problem, what did you notice? Exactly like you said, there will be kids that will say, well, seven is too large to hold one hand, and I'm not sure, and they'll have a whole story. <laughs> and that's wonderful. But what else could you notice about that problem? And then have them talk to you about that. Well, seven is actually like five and two, 
and two and three, and, and they'll go and they'll do different thinking on that. So that's a good one. Another one, if they're just whipping out the answers with these, ask them, can you show me? Show me how you got that answer. Instead of just, again, this is the answer. This one is what we use in the classroom, but you could make it into your family, or you could just word it a little differently. Can anyone do it a different way? So if this person memorized it and know the answer, knew the answer, what's another way you could come to that same answer? How do you know? A lot of the times when I'm teaching first grade math, I will have something like seven plus three. They'll whip out the answer and I'll say, how do you know? And the answer is usually, mom is not told. <laughs> okay, that's good. And then you go in. But how do you know that that's the correct answer? And is it the correct answer? Often when I'm teaching math, they'll do it. They'll show me the answer. Like, OK, Ms. Marshall, praise me now. Praise me. I did it. I got the answer. And I won't show it on my face. And then they start to question themselves. OK, she's not smiling at me. I wonder if I got it wrong. But let them think it through. I wonder if I did get it right. Oh, I better try it a different way. I better check it. Maybe I'll check it on my fingers. I got to try a different way. I love this one. Can you tell me your strategy? Number one, it's got a huge, big adult word in it. So they are really smart when they can say, well, Miss Marshall, my strategy is. And they'll tell you how they got it. Would you share how you got that answer? One of the things we're finding with our first graders is that they can get an answer and they know an answer. But how did you get that answer using your words? Tell me, how did you get the answer? And after they're able to tell you by words, have them write it down. We're going to be having math journals in math. All right, you knew the answer. Now tell me how you did it using your words so that you can explain your math thinking. And as they go through the grades, this becomes a very, very important part. Those kids who are memorizing the answers, they have a very difficult time <coughs> explaining their math thinking. And I do know my kids love this one. Prove it. They give you an answer, just math them, okay? Prove it. Well, mom. And they do the same thing with me. What they're going to find is as we're doing this in the classroom and as you start doing it with homework, you're going to get to that higher level math thing. And that's what we want. So we took that same problem, the seven and the three, and we are showing it in the three ways, um, Stacy alluded to this, the concrete pictorial and abstract. Again, we want kids, all kids, no matter their math understanding, to understand it from this way to this way. It's not fair, it's not right to get them to just spit out what was probably in your head, this abstract number sentence. But that stems from the concrete, actually physically having things. This is okay during math homework. Have pennies, have Cheerios, have paper clips, whatever. Even those who can picture it, we want to see it. So maybe they need to draw it out for us. And they could draw the seven balls that were already there and the three more. So even drawing it, seeing it, visualizing it. And when we ask that question, how do you know what was in my brain? What was it? Oh, it was seven of these balls over here and three over here. OK, now I'm starting to see it. That can transition into this, which is a number bond. Um, this is huge in the Math and Focus um, curriculum. It'll carry throughout the grade levels. So this being um, the whole number and then the parts. Sometimes a number bond has many parts because numbers can be made up in many ways. So this is manipulating the number and understanding that I, one person had seven, the other person has three more, so that must mean the whole is ten. This could work for subtraction. I had 10 balls. I gave Mrs. Strobridge three. How many are left? 10 is made up of seven and three. You can interact. You can change those around. And that's how I understand the number 10. Then that transitioned into I understand that seven and three is the same as 10. So 
So that's kind of the way, even if you look at homework coming home or sheets, you might not see this piece or any of this thinking before because a lot of it happens with manipulatives, with things and drawing in the room. So that's the understanding that's behind the map. And I was just going to say, when I introduce this in my math class, one of the things I do is I do take the number gone, they solve it, and then I take these guys and I move it to the side. Exact same figure, but I move it to the side and they think it's a whole new problem. And then I'll move it down here, put the little circles down here, and they think it's a whole new other problem. And that's good. Have them decide that. Well, no matter what I do, I will have parts and holes. And That's I, the pictorial. <laughs> um, I think that goes back to how they have to be able to go through all of the stages to be able to really know what they're talking about. Because a lot of kids in first grade can do this, and then you ask them to prove it, and they say, well, I'm smart. I'm good at math. I know how to do this. But they really have a hard time you know, visualizing it or drawing it out or proving what they know, they just know that. So I think it does go back to like the growth mindset too versus the fixed. If you just say, I'm what, smart, I'm smart, I know it. You gotta push yourself to give more and, and to kind of relate it to the other two areas too. Um, right when we leave math, we'll go back to our homerooms and we're gonna have our snack time in our um, homeroom classrooms. Um, as while we're doing calendar math. So another component of math and focus is um, everyday counts, which is a math curriculum for calendar. So it's the days of the week and the patterns in the calendar, but it also adds problem solving and discussion. Um, so we decided to keep this piece in our homeroom and just encourage that rich discussion in um, problem solving and talking about numbers with our homeroom class. So this will be another five to 10 minute discussion and a great time to just have snack and, and engage in that. Just a reminder that we do have allergies, um, especially nut allergies, so we can't send nut snacks to school. Um, just sending snacks to your child um, that are on the healthier side, no chips, no chocolate, um, no candy, but um, also something that they can open, hopefully, getting in that independence level too, and nothing that needs additional silverware or it's just a simple, quick snack set. I thought of something I wanted to add with the independence part about recess, and I know we kind of emphasize it in kindergarten with the self-care aspect, but even in first grade, please make sure when winter comes around that they're gonna be able to put on those snow boots, those snow pants. It is a quick transition in and out of the building, but they really have to become independent with those things. So paying attention to the weather changes. Um, if they have a new spring jacket, sometimes those zippers are tricky. Make sure that they've practiced that at home. I know shoe tying has been a big um, learning curve and a lot of people are learning how to do that, but just making sure that they're able to take care of their own clothing, um, especially during that recess and transition time, um, and as efficiently as possible in a timely manner, but thanks. There's um, a math in focus resource on the district webpage also, so if you're interested in that, if you go under that parent tab again, I believe if you go all the way down, there's math and focus resources, and it'll bring you. We'll send you the link to that as well in a later date. After that time period, if you're following along, we get to the content area. And our content for first grade is science, social studies, and health. In the science, we are very lucky that we have Mrs. Warmka as our science teacher. The kids absolutely love her, and she does do a lot of that growth mindset, getting kids to think beyond us just that one answer. In the packet, it does show the units that she will be teaching in science. And then we also teach the solar system and the sky towards the end of the year. It also is listing for the social studies units, the All About Me, families, national holidays, current events, cultures around the world. And as I said, we are starting into the All About Me and the families. And then the health is pretty much a year-long situation for first grade. Because when we're talking about health, we're talking about healthy life habits, which goes into the snack, which goes into the recess, which goes if you have a cold, if you're not feeling good, if you have a cut. And it has you know, bus safety, anything where you look at the child and think, how can I keep them healthy and safe? That's that aspect. 
We know we're running a little short on time here. We still want to get you into your child's classroom. So just quickly, uh, we have a weekly library. It's usually the same day, different in each person's classroom. Um, and homework, we recommend about 10 minutes a night. Uh, they're still young and we want to make sure they get out and play and there's a lot to be learned with play also. So for home, for math, or for reading, sorry, they could be reading their own book 10 minutes a night. You could be reading to them. In October, spelling work will come home, so there'll be something a little more on that line to do. Periodically, math homework will come home. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. Hard copies of how to access school view or a little bit about school view. 